in this report, let us oxygenate the awful truth about load leveling hitches in towing using nutbag commentary for illustration. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. It's a curious facet of the modern world, I think, that it's becoming ever more common for the imbecile to feel empowered and thus inflict his quote-unquote knowledge upon us using the power of the keyboard and the raw distributive capacity of the internets. In this session, you failed to mention ride levelling and sway control. This is something I notice is sadly missing from a lot of caravans and other heavy items being towed. Ride levelling does shift tow ball load onto the front axle of the car and place extra loading on the trailer van axle combination. Any person considering towing a caravan ride levelling should mandatory inclusion. So after enjoying that message a couple of times, I pointed out to Mr S that I thought he was being rude and hypercritical and that the report he was criticising was actually about choosing the right vehicle for particular towing assignments and therefore load levelling was kind of outside its remit. And also, that's not what a load levelling hitch actually does, you muppet. Joyously enough, of course, he got back to me with even more... Um, information. You have missed the point that ride levelling reduces the down load on the tow ball. This can assist a European vehicle with a lower permissible loading without going to the expense of additional spring packs. It routinely amazes me how ignorant people are about basic physics and also literacy, but let's not go there. I mean, here is your basic uninformed dick, right? And he feels empowered to tell me how this works. And that's kind of okay, as long as he's right. And in this situation, uninformed dick versus engineering degree, I decided that the gloves should probably come off for the rest of our exchange. And let me say up front that I am absolutely not above being corrected by anyone. However, pro tip, if you are going to voice some contrary opinion, A, try to be correct, and B, use diplomacy, just in case you're wrong. It deeply offends me that this asshole might be inflicting his breathtaking bullshit on people who cannot see through this stuff. So here's the headline, okay? Load levelling hitches do not decrease tow ball download. They actually increase it slightly, but only by the additional weight of the load levelling hitch. And this, of course, is what they look like. All they do is they stop the arse end of the vehicle from dragging in the dirt when a heavy trailer is connected, and they also stop the headlights from pointing up at the sky, which is the flip side of that same coin. And they do this by applying a torque to the vehicle using spring tension cranked up with screw threads and chains. Time for some basic physics in the beer garden. <laughs> yes. So here's the basic problem as I see it, okay? You've got your heavy trailer and you've got your SUV and Isaac Newton is just not getting together happily ever after with both of them. And they're bending in the middle like that. And it's basically just a matter of what do you do to resolve this and make the whole thing work properly? And how do you understand exactly what loads are operating, okay? So if we just assume that the mass center of the trailer is kind of there, just this way a little bit from the axle line, and you think about how the mass of that trailer is gonna be resolved or opposed, what's supporting it and just stopping it plummeting straight down to the center of the earth or something. So you've obviously got relatively big forces just under the wheels here, supplied by the ground, pushing up to the tune of about 90% of the mass of the trailer. And 
in many markets, you know, 10% is kind of the design load that's, you know, applied to the tow ball and it's opposed in the same way that the ground opposes the mass of the trailer over here, then the tow ball of the SUV is going to oppose 10% of the mass of the trailer over on this end. So there's about 10% here, about 90% there. And obviously that means that if there's a thousand kilos overall in the trailer, 900 kilos being pressed up like this under the wheels and about a hundred up here at the tow ball. And the more the trailer weighs, two tons, that's 1.8 tons and 200 kilos, three tons, 2.7 tons, 300 kilos, like that. Let's ballpark it in that manner. And then you got to say to yourself, right, well, what is that actually doing to the SUV? And basically, it's pointing the headlights up here at the stars and it's dragging the ass of the SUV in the ground. And the reason it can do that is because this load that is opposed here by the SUV, it's imposed by the trailer, opposed by the SUV and obviously it's pushing down on the back of the SUV and the SUV is sitting on springs so it can move and it adopts this dodgy sort of attitude that does not really help at all when you want to steer around a bend and it's also not that stable under brakes as well because there can be these awful sort of feedback effects with the braking that do that porpoising. You've probably seen heavy trailers porpoise when they're uh, when they're braking and that's very scary if you're sitting in the driver's seat as well and not a great deal you can do about it because any sort of action that you might take is counterintuitive right so you've got to say to yourself well how can we cure that and there could be a number of different thought experiments such as if you see an elephant or a rhinoceros just off to the side you might shoot it and stick it directly over the bonnet but a couple of problems with that <laughs> they're protected, it's going to add mass to the whole setup, which is probably not what you want either. And it's hard to see over an elephant or a rhino draped over the bonnet. At least that's what I'm told. Or I guess you could hire yourself a Black Hawk helicopter and put a sling around here and drag the whole thing up into the sky as well. Although I think it's about $7,000 an hour just to keep a Black Hawk turning and burning above you. So this kind of solution would be prohibitively expensive for many of us. Therefore, what could you do? I suppose you could put another wheel under here as well, but that's not ideal either because of the fact that you'd have to incorporate suspension travel and all of that stuff. So what do you really do here? What's an idea that does not involve the imposition of mass on the front or you know jacking up the rear with some sort of wheel that was designed to work like that? And the obvious answer is you could just impose a torque like this on the four-wheel drive, couldn't you? So you could spin it around in that anti-clockwise direction and that would serve to push the nose down and kick the ass back up into the air. And the really cool thing about torque is that it doesn't impose additional load. See, the loads here are merely a product, this is static load, okay, are merely a product of gravity and mass in either case. And the, the attitude that these trailer and the vehicle adopt is just a matter of the interaction of those two different loads, but the total load doesn't change. So if you can see your way clear to imposing a torque, then that's gonna solve the problem without the penalty of additional mass. And you gotta ask yourself, well, how do you do that? And you do that with a load distribution hitch. Now, we've gotta think about it like this. It's really just the same as getting a dirty big spanner like this and putting it anywhere on the body because the thing about torque that is also really cool on a rigid body is that you can move the torque anywhere on the rigid body and it has exactly the same effect. So we could put a weightless beam out here, you know, several hundred kilometers if we wanted. As long as it was weightless and infinitely rigid, we could move the torque up there or we could move it three and a half light years to whatever it is, Alpha Centauri or something, and it wouldn't make any difference to the effect of that torque on the rigid body of that car. And essentially that's all that load distribution hitch does. It generates the torque here, but it's easier I think if you're a beer garden physicist like all of us to think about it in terms of operating in the center of the vehicle there and just spinning it like that. And that will help it just adopt a slightly different attitude. One that we like a bit better. So instead of what you're looking at there, one would hope that we get to operate it a little more normally so that it kind of 
looks a bit more like this. And I think we'd all be happier with this. I'd be happier driving around sharing the road with a vehicle that looked more like that, even though it weighed exactly the same. So that's not a bad idea if you can get away with it, is it? Just make sure you can see that one. You can see that one as well. Happy days. Okay, so this is just the difference between applying this torque here and not. But what you've got to also acknowledge is that the loads really haven't changed. The total mass of this whole setup is the same. So the effect on the braking system and the effect of inertial loads in cornering and all of that stuff. All this does, this torque, is it just spins this vehicle around. It lifts the back end of the trailer up because, hey, the spinning of the vehicle, in, it's connected here, this is a hinge. So if you spin this around, it's gonna lift the whole thing up. But it does not change the load that the tow ball experiences as a result of holding the nose of the trailer out of the road. Okay, so the load imposed by the trailer is purely a product of the mass of the trailer and the geometry, how far the mass center is offset from the center of the axle line. So that's gonna be imposing a torque like that that's restrained like that by the tow ball of this vehicle. And if you put a load distribution hitch on it, you'll change the orientation of both of these vehicles, but you'll change nothing about the load down through the tow ball. What you will change though, is the load on the front axle and the load on the rear axle. The effect of the load distribution hitch, okay, is to take some of this load that is resolved at the back end of the vehicle and move it to the front. And that's what essentially that torque does. It presses down here and it lifts up there. The load here remains spectacularly unchanged. Just to recap, uninformed dick position. You have missed the point that ride levelling reduces the down load on the tow ball. This can assist a European vehicle with the lower permissible loading without going to the expense of additional spring backs. No, 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 no. Au contraire, you <laughs> spectacularly vocal and yet scientifically illiterate and preposterously uninformed. It can't do that. Therefore, please stop giving people this advice because if they follow it, their vehicles could easily be overloaded and they will thus be towing illegally. That's bad. This can overload all kinds of things. You might break the vehicle or the tow hitch. It can get you defected at the roadside if you are weighed by the rosers. You might even crash and none of this is fun. I mean, I've had fun fun once or twice, and this is definitely not it. Don't get me wrong though. Load leveling hitches can boost stability generally when you are towing a heavy load. They can increase steering effectiveness and stop the vehicle from squirming around and otherwise being dynamically unstable under brakes. But they are called load leveling hitches and not tow ball lightening up hitches for a friggin' reason. They are not a get out of jail free card to exceed the vehicle's tow ball download limit, which is specified by the manufacturer, and they cannot reduce the tow ball download, which is imposed upon the vehicle by the trailer. They're potentially dangerous too. Those springs that you wind up, right? They have a great deal of energy stored in them. So I would really not be getting any part of me in the way of them suddenly unloading should they slip off those chains. Imagine that hitting you fair in the steel capped safety thong. It'd certainly be memorable. You need to appreciate that the terrain underfoot can militate against these hitches too in the worst possible way. You need to avoid situations where the vehicle adopts a nose up attitude relative to the trailer thanks to the road underfoot. In particular, a spoon drain or a wash away across the road is a potential disaster. Once you've got the front axle of the vehicle past an obstacle like that, a transverse kind of defect, then the rear axle goes in, right? The front axle is up high, the trailer axles are up high, the vehicle's rear axle is low. That's bad. 
So let's just have a big think for a minute about what happens when you drive your vehicle that's got a load distribution hitch here and it's sitting perfect on the road as you drive down a nice level piece of road and it's behaving beautifully under brakes and all that stuff and then you drive into a spoon drain or there's a wash away on the track in front. So it's not gravity and static load making the vehicle turn into this banana shape. It's actually the geometry of the track underfoot. So you've got relatively high ground here and relatively low ground here because here's the spoon drain and relatively high ground here causing the vehicle to adopt this attitude. And what you've got is a spring in here that's being used to generate this torque. And this spring is experiencing massive load because not only is it in this attitude where it's just restraining that load and leveling things up, you are bending that spring even more now. It's already pretty bent when you're driving around with the whole configuration level like this, but it is really heavily loaded when you do that. And essentially, it's this sort of isolated geometric deficiency here, bananaing the whole thing up, that can break something expensive. It may not break the spring, but these components, you know, the tow hitch itself and all the structural members in here that resolve the loads inside the actual tow bar and the tow hitch itself, they're under massive load as a result of this kind of track configuration. So if you don't get out and unbolt those springs and go back to floppy hinge sort of scenario here, you can break something expensive. And hey, if you're in the outback of Australia and you're in the middle of nowhere, that can be an unmitigated disaster for you because you'll have your $50,000 horse float with horses in it or your, your trailer that's cost you heaps, your caravan that's cost you heaps, a big boat, you'll have to leave it on the side of the road because, hey, you won't be towing it anymore. And that's if the vehicle itself remains mobile as a result of the failure that goes on here. So anytime you get to one of these deficiencies, get out, spend the time, unbolt the tow hitch and take the tension off the springs. Otherwise, you are absolutely courting disaster. This kind of event, okay, it has the potential to place extreme loads on the springs within that hitch. And that is a recipe for breaking something, possibly something expensive. So you might want to remember to decouple the load leveler, in other words, to detension those springs before you negotiate obstacles like that. Otherwise, you might risk breaking something expensive on the tow hitch or even within the vehicle itself. And this, of course, is why many manufacturers advise you not to use these kinds of load leveling hitches. The other thing you really need to get right here is to choose the right load leveling hitch for the load that you are actually towing because they are not a one size fits all proposition. A mismatch here between the hitch and the load is a disaster in search of the worst place to happen. So if it was me, okay, I would simply be asking myself if it's really such a good idea to put a band-aid on a much bigger problem. Is it really a good idea pursuing some fool's errand to tow something that's clearly a bit of a struggle for the vehicle? That's not fun. I mean, I that's not fun either. It's just not. Perhaps you should consider acquiring a smaller van or a smaller boat or maybe even a bigger, more capable vehicle. Lastly, of course, do not take any advice from uninformed, scientifically illiterate dickheads on any stuff that really matters in so many different domains. Wouldn't it be just ace if our politicians remembered to do that? And now some carefully considered diplomatic and somewhat compassionate feedback from you. You trying to sound intelligent with your babble, but just sound like a wanker. Thanks for wasting me time. My pleasure, Chris. You're absolutely welcome, mate. In my estimation, of course, your life is at best worthless. And when you think about it in those terms, it's not really that much of a waste then, is it? Your time spent watching my videos is time not spent inflicting yourself on those around you which is clearly a liberating net benefit to them. The chinks, 
That's one of the things I used to be called in the 80s for having yellow skin and slanty eyes. So glad that slur is still being used in 2019. Mel, come on, mate. The difference between you and me, you hypersensitive snowflake, is that I don't call anyone a racist if they call me an Aussie. How are those two things any different, I ask you? Chink is a contracted bastardization of the term Chinese, just like Aussie is a bastardized contraction of being born in Shitsville. But just to be clear on this, okay, and so there is no misunderstanding, no matter if you're an Aussie, a Jap, a Chink, a Yank, a Pom, a Kiwi, a Frog, an Itai, a Hebe, a Camel Jockey, a Canuck, a Rusky, or a Gaijin like me, I love you all equally. So you might ask yourself, why does he do this? Why does he push people's buttons in such an offensive manner? Or is there a bigger point at play that needs oxygenating? And I think there is. Because it concerns the most significant freedom that you or I enjoy on a daily basis, which would be the freedom of speech. That's really important because if you take that out of play, wherever you live now, it rapidly turns into North Korea and nobody wants that. So what speech actually needs protecting, okay? Because it's certainly not the vanilla speech that nobody disagrees with. There's no reason to have laws protecting that. What needs protecting is speech that other people potentially find offensive because that's the speech that's going to be under the gun all the time. And basically, we need to live in societies where we are free to debate ideas with as few a set of restrictions as possible. But obviously, there are restrictions and I strive to comply with those, believe it or not. There are legal restrictions and then the mediums that you operate in, be it radio, TV, YouTube, whatever, they all have codes of conduct. YouTube calls its codes of conduct a set of community guidelines and they're very similar to the codes of conduct that I had to comply with when I worked on radio and television. And basically, you're not allowed to vilify people based on things like their gender, their race, their religion, their age, their sexual orientation, things like that. If you wonder what vilify actually means, it means to incite hatred of or violence against. It does not mean that you may not criticise or satirise that kind of thing. That is absolutely up for grabs. And that's all I'm doing. I'm imposing satire on groups sometimes that don't appreciate it or upon groups, individual members of which at times express outrage about. So let's talk about outrage and offence. In a free speech society, okay, you do not get the right not to be outraged or offended by what people say. If you're outraged or offended, that is a matter for you. It might not be a choice you make because, hey, it's obviously an emotional response and we don't really have control of our emotions. They happen internally to us. So you don't get that right, though, not to be outraged by something I say. And I get a lot of comments and they start with, mate, love your videos, but... And they don't, they definitely aren't comments that are aimed at telling you that love your videos. It's all about the but. And it's all about the but don't call us chinks or but don't have a shot at God or religion or any of that stuff. Well, I've got to say, it's all up for grabs. It's all completely fair enough. And what I hope is, if you are outraged by something I say, then I hope it leads you to some internal inquiry. You might like to have a little bit of a think about why you are so outraged about some of this stuff. And if you are outraged and you decide that it is entirely valid, then why don't you go on a bit of a crusade of your own, a jihad of sorts, to prosecute the rational argument that your point of view is correct. I get that. Or your alternative uh, course of action, I guess, is for your internal inquiry to lead you to the conclusion that you don't actually have the right not to be offended by that at all because of freedom of speech or because it's exactly the same as an Aussie being referred to as an Aussie and it might absolutely be ridiculous for somebody like me to express my outrage that you have not re referred to me as an Australian instead of 
an Aussie, which I find almost as offensive as the N-word. In any case, being offended serves a valuable purpose in our society if you channel it the right way. So if you are offended by what I say, I am specifically and spectacularly unapologetic. Reported after 1305, dog shit is Stan. Are you racist or something? It pains me to point out to anyone who failed to pay attention ever at school that dog shit is Stan is not actually a country. I mean, it should be, clearly, but it's not, unfortunately. Therefore, it is quite difficult to be authentically racist against dog shit Estanis. But I do try. Racist, homophobic, shittist, and an Islamophobe. What can I say? <laughs> Why not collect the boxed set of virtue signaling outrage allegations? Come on, Islamic fundamentalist sex doll. How are you still walking the streets of this earth? What a total racist, bigoted ass. Hmm? Okay. Are you sure about that? Right. In breaking news, ISIS researchers have developed a revolutionary new autonomous fundamentalist sex doll. It blows itself up. Pro tip, Islam is a religion, okay, not a race. One cannot therefore be racist in respect of Islam. Religions are sets of ideas, and ideas are open to debate and criticism. In my view, religions are compendiums of generally bad ideas, and therefore quite okay to satirise. You don't have to like it, okay? I'm not especially desperate for anyone's approval. And hey, if, if I'm wrong, okay, what's going to happen? I will burn in hell, which is only slightly worse than an eternity of friggin' harp music, when you think about it.